So we'll start today. After Easter, we're still, we're still on Easter, Easter night. And we're going to pick up in, in the book of John. We're way out of Matthew now. John chapter 20. Yeah, verse 19. And my heading says, Jesus among his disciples. So when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. And I'll stop there. Still, still Easter night. Um, we're, we're in Emmaus. So earlier, it was a little bit earlier last, last week. And here's, here's the future leaders of the church of which we are a product of. The leaders of the first Christian church. Here they are shaking in fear behind locked doors knowing that if our leader is dead they're coming after us next so we better hide um, of course when it says for fear of the Jews that's a reference to the, the religious Jewish leaders the Jewish leaders but still, I, it's interesting that your own, your own people you're afraid of. So they were wavering here. This is, a, this is unstable. It's a fearful time right now. The one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is double mind, a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. They were tossed by the wind of natural perception. And that's because in the natural at that moment, things looked pretty grim. Jesus is dead. That's what they're thinking. And where is he? Now, they had eyewitness reports. Uh, Mary came probably earlier, knocked on the door. Hey, I, I saw Jesus, and they, um, obviously they didn't take much to heart on that. Two guys come off ecstatic off of the road out of, uh, from Emmaus, or two people, I'm sorry, we don't know if they're both guys. Um, Mary was crazy. These two witnesses from Emmaus they said it, but we still don't see him. So they needed evidence is what they needed to make them, oh, everything's going to be okay, right? But we, we know already, which they didn't, these scriptures weren't written yet, we know that it's not evidence that we need because actually faith is the evidence anyway. So uh, Hebrews chapter 11 Verse 1, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That's a verse to ponder for a while after you read it in context. So in the natural, it's hard to believe for all of us. Now we say, of course, we believe Jesus died and rose from the dead. But it, it is very difficult in the natural for any of us to believe that someone just rose from the dead, isn't it? I mean, I'll give plenty of examples, but if I went out to the, the graveyard right now, 
by myself, no witnesses around, and I, I, uh, I, I saw someone coming out of the grave, and then I came back in here, you guys would have trouble believing that. You would want to see it, right? Um, if I told you that I, I saw two of the most high, these are, this is the two most highest paid dead celebrities in all of history, right there. If I told you that I saw Michael Jackson and Elvis risen from the grave walking down Grand Avenue, you would think I'm nuts. Probably would lose the whole church, and I think my wife might leave me or take me to the third floor somewhere. Um, and even if you saw them, you would have doubts, right? Because there's Elvis impersonators and Michael Jackson impersonators, maybe. There probably is. Um, did they both call themselves the king, too? I just thought of that. Well, one of them did. The pop king? Yeah, that's weird. Anyway, um, why would you doubt? You would have to do forensic evidence on it because the reason we're doubting, stuff like that just doesn't happen because it's supernatural. It's, it's the spiritual is hard for us to accept. And that's really our issue, isn't it? We, we fantasize about the supernatural. We fantasize, we imagine the spiritual, and it, we, we place it as, as humans as a whole in the confines of movies and things that we can see through screens or in books of fiction. You know why? Because it's safe there. It's not really real. And that's the whole thing with the resurrection because that is really real. And because it's really real, then you have to do something and you have to react, acknowledging that it's real. It's going to change your whole life. But we like safety and we like things to be seen and being able to touch things. So the spiritual, it's hard. It's difficult to accept, and that's because we are immersed in the natural world, in the physical world, in the material world, whatever you want to say. I mean, it's hard to grab a cup and drink out of it if it's not there. It just is. Paul explains all of this. Brilliant. Guided by the Spirit, of course. 1 Corinthians 2.14, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. The reason... The disciples are locked behind closed doors is because they're thinking in the natural. Same thing, same reason we do what we do when we begin to think in the natural and we fall into, um, we fall into places where we're locking ourselves behind doors, forgetting about the power of God just because we haven't seen it. When we forget who we are in Christ and what the risen Jesus has accomplished. So at this point, in this fearful, unstable, they need to hear oceans, I mean. Even though they've already seen it. Seen tons of, they've, seen, they've seen miracles more than we can ever imagine. They had more proof and evidence than we could. Why are they behind locked doors afraid of the, the Jewish leaders? Well, they needed it. What they needed was, and Jesus tells us, but an impartation of understanding. They needed to have a spiritual awakening. Because they were stuck in the natural. Now, in the Greek, to the soul or the natural fallen instinct of man, 
as unspiritual. That natural person, that word, and however it is in your Bible, it's going to be something similar, but it is, it is the, the fallen instinct of man. It is the, the natural, um, unspiritual man or a woman, human. It's the psychikos. It's where, where we get our word for psychology. And that's in contrast to verse 15 where it says, the spiritual person. That is the pneumatikos. And you'll, you know pneuma is spirit and breath. And in the Greek dictionary, actually, it, it has literally the sense, the expression of that, that word is in one breath in, in the lexicon. In one breath. So in one breath from the living God, it only takes one breath from God to do incredible things because his breath, his spirit can take dust from the ground and create life from it. Just one. Or bring to life through what maybe, I don't know, one of his prophets, dead bones. Where flesh just wraps around it and it all comes to life. This is the kind of supernatural God we're talking about. Genesis 2, 7, then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. Ezekiel 37, in verse 3, and he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, oh, Lord God, you know. And then he said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. In that chapter, Ezekiel goes on to say in verse 14, and I'll put my spirit within you and you shall live and I will place you in your own land then you shall know that I am the Lord I have spoken and I will do it declares the Lord so that was one you know that was a a different son of man and now the perfect son of man Jesus is here coming to give his followers new breath once again, life, a new creation, and that is what we are in Christ. First Corinthians, here's that verse, 1545, thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust, and the second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven? What? Bear, we're going to bear the image of Jesus? That's what it says. But I would say, Paul, how can we bear the image of the man of heaven? How could that be? How could we even understand what he wrote? Because this is, this is deep stuff. I feel like I have to go to Bible school just to read it. Well, you can't. Without what those unstable, wavering, untrusting, fearful disciples received, and that was the same thing, a breath of life from the living God. And that's because without him, we are spiritually dead. Ephesians 2.1. We're, we're dead to the reality of who he is, and we're enslaved into our natural thinking, and that's what gets us into trouble. When we think, oh, this looks really bad. <laughs> In churches we do, right? 
I didn't really feel the spirit this morning. You know, I, didn't, I, didn't feel, I wasn't feeling it today. We get in situations where, I, you know, you have every reason to fear, right, in your mind, and it's, it's thinking in the natural. And you're thinking, unless something changes, I have to see this. I, I need to see something to tell me otherwise. And we get those questions many times. You, you should if you're actually out beyond the four walls talking to people about your faith. You're going to get the question eventually, well, then why do bad things happen? And why don't I see God showing up? And how come God hasn't done this? Why hasn't God healed me yet? Why am I still in debt? Well, that, that's another one. That's another topic. Never mind. Um, why am I not blessed? Well, it's based on your definition of blessing. Because Matthew 5 should be your definition, not your, the world's definition. But we, we have to see something to have faith. We, we have this struggle, but the, it said that faith is actually the evidence. of. So <laughs> these disciples are going through this because they've been, they've, they've been stubborn. But look what happens to, look how graceful Jesus is. Even though he didn't have to, he's, he's going to show them his hands and feet. He's going to show them. He's going to send them out to be his hands and feet eventually, to carry on this mission because that's where this is going. His body, continuing his purposes on earth, and this breath of life that they're, they're receiving in this scene Basically, basically, it's all the Bible school they're ever going to need. It's like the degree, an MDiv in a breath, because we see what happens. Luke 24, 44, and we're just in the same timeline, in the same scene, just from Luke's perspective, so adding some things, right, based on the audience. Luke 24, 44, and he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was with you that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand Scripture. It wasn't just some ethereal breath, spirit thing. He's giving them the, the, the wisdom from the Spirit to understand Scripture so that they can be used for God's purposes and reach the nations. To know his spirit and proclaim the same message that would either actually cause people to resist because they're denying forgiveness, so they're over their sins, or they respond to the gospel and they receive forgiveness. And that's what that verse means. It's not saying that I have the power to wipe away your sins. Of course, that's not possible. When, when, when the gospel is proclaimed, their forgiveness comes on your response based on that power. And the forgiveness goes if, if people deny it. And that's powerful. So he opened their minds. And then he closes in Luke 24, 46. And he says, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer on the third day, rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins, should, there it is, should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses, the word for martyrs, of these things. And behold, I'm sending you the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. So no, this isn't Pentecost. Pentec that's a separate thing. So he calms their fears he opened their minds, and, and now they, ha they have an understanding now that they've had a hard time getting, an understanding, a standing of Scripture. He gives them a mission, and then he gives them another promise 
power from on high to be witnesses to the entire world of people who are lost even today for us suffering in the natural because they turn on the news and they see, oh man, uh, Iran is bombing Israel and uh, things are getting really bad and what am I going to do? And they're thinking in the natural and they're panicking. And they need people to proclaim the body of Christ who has just been together, worshiping together, partaking of communion together to proclaim this good news to them, to give them a reason for hope that it doesn't matter what war goes down, we have eternal life and we have purpose here. For the disciples, well, there was something beyond that breath because we see obviously that wasn't Pentecost because they're not acting pretty any bolder after this moment. We see them make a few mistakes and we'll continue the account of uh, after Easter in the next few Sundays. But their trust, at that moment, their trust in, in the power of Jesus was eclipsing the fear that they once lived in. And this is really cool. I, after this day, after this moment, when, when, they're, when it says they're in phobos, the, the word for phobia that we get, that's that word for fear in the Greek, um, you will not find the disciples uh, religious Jew-phobic anymore. You will not find, I searched, for the, I searched the word fear in the book of Acts. I put it in, in, in my Bible software, did a search. I put it in your, uh, uh, your Bible app this morning. I believe I did that. I, I can't remember. I've, I've not slept since this morning, but yeah. So I searched, I searched for the word fear. So in the book of Acts, after Pentecost, after the Holy Spirit falls, the word fear is used 12 times. And it is never used in the this, this sense of the disciples being afraid of man. It is always used in reference to the fear of God. The awe, the, and the fear of God is not some, oh man, horror movie, some kind of fear. It's a reverent, just an awesome respect for God. So, re, so honoring him and, and revering him that you'll do anything for him. That's the kind of fear they experience after the Holy Spirit. So we see evidence in the account that they turn from those fearful, unstable disciples to what they are now in the book of Acts, qualified to begin the church in the power of the Spirit. So the fear of man is gone. I'm sure they had their moments, but it's different. It's different when you get into the book of Acts because they're not hiding behind locked doors anymore. In fact, in, instead of hiding behind locked doors, they have natural man-made authorities throw them into prison. And then they're in the prison and spiritual authorities like angels take them out. Everything's, everything's different. What's the difference? The power of the Spirit. And they're only set free to go back and witness invisible things to a visible world. That's what proclaiming the gospel is doing. We are bearing witness of spiritual things that our natural man really doesn't want to understand because it likes the flesh and the things of the world. And it's safe not knowing about all this spiritual stuff. But it's safe, but you know what? It's hopeless. It's hopeless. And that's why the gospel is hope. And that's why we need power to, we need power to proclaim it. That's why we're here. To be witnesses, martyrs even, until the end of the age. And you can see a hint of this. You can see a hint of this in John's vision, in Revelation 11.11. 11. It says, but after three and a half days, here's another breath of life. That's, that's the last breath of life reference like that in the Bible. From God entered them and they stood up on their feet and great fear fell on those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud and their enemies watched them. 
So in the midst of havoc and chaos, we see this vision of witnesses proclaiming unto death the message that brought their death, lying dead in the streets, and that same message brings them to life. Witnesses of Jesus Christ. If we're witnesses, we don't see him now. I mean, last Sunday I said, just imagine him walking around in the aisles. I mean, that's just like an imagined point for you because he's not in the flesh here, but his spirit is here. It's always here. And the spirit does and goes where it wants to, what it wants to do, where he wants to go. Not up to us. 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 15, 54. This is what we know if we're witnesses of Jesus Christ. This is what gives us hope. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? And 2 Timothy 1, 7. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave to us in Christ Jesus before ages began, and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. You see, the gospel brings light to the spiritual. But we don't understand the spiritual without the spirit because we get in the natural. So you can see his plans coming, coming to pass taking us from fear and being enslaved to the natural consequences of our sin. Fear. Enslaved, the consequences of our sin, that's that, right? Just picture Adam and Eve hiding because we're naked. We messed up. Please don't don't let him find me because he's going to spite me. And a a lot of people still have that image about God, that run and hide image, that... just always out to get you, right? You're never good enough. Never good enough. That's the consequences of sin, ladies and gentlemen. So he wants to take us from fear enslaved by the natural consequences of our sin to peace and being empowered, being free by the supernatural consequences of the blood of Jesus Christ. There is a consequence, a result of that blood that often we just casually maybe take as a right or a tradition. And the, the consequence is, is freedom. It's victory. It's victory for your life. But this morning, obviously, I think we have a problem. And this would be in the spirit. And the problem is, you don't feel like you're walking in victory. And the the worst part about that is, is the pride of religion keeps you from admitting that. Right? Because it's, it's this thing where we have to look the part and play the part. And how do I be the best Christian I can be? What do I have to do to be saved? (laughs) Who's that, Nicodemus? I think you got to be born again. I think you need something, you know, beyond yourself. I think you need the Spirit of God. Because if we really were truly walking in victory, I think that things would look different in our community, in the body of Christ, in the church. And I'm saying we, like all of us, right? Because it is, it's that religion 
that also gets us, we get great offense when, when preachers say things or when people say things. And all it is, is it, it, it becomes critical in this mess, and it, it's, it's religion. And Jesus died to, to abolish that too because he gave us a better way that it doesn't have that kind of burden. But at the same time, the gospel is offensive. It was offensive to me in my natural mind and my sin. And when I get in the natural, it's still going to be offensive to me because the natural person does not like the spiritual. But today, like I said, it might not feel like victory to you. It doesn't always, it doesn't always feel like it, right? It never, really, it never really had to feel like it. It never in the Bible says, hey, you, you got to feel my presence shaking through you to know that I'm real. It was about faith and trust in his word. Sometimes it doesn't look like it. It never had to either. And today for many believers, uncertainty, fear, doubt, anxiety, the pain is overwhelming. The news feeds. If you let that determine your state of mind, I, I, I feel sorry for you. I feel sorry for you. As I speak as someone once in bondage to news feeds and now set free, but it takes discipline. You know, it's hard, right? Because we want to know. It's in our news feeds. It's in our pop-up ads that we have. It's in our personal lives and our, our family. And you know what it feels like right now? It kind of feels like uh, this scripture right here. It kind of feels like Luke 21, 25. And there will be strange signs in the sun, moon, and stars. And here on earth, the nations will be in turmoil, perplexed by the roaring seas and strange tides. We're not talking literal there. People will be terrified at what they see coming upon the earth for the powers in the heavens will be shaken. They've been shaken. They've been shaken for a long time. And then you're waiting. You're waiting for signs. Waiting for some last Armageddon like stuff to go down before it, then you'll really get serious about the Lord. And there's a danger in that. Because you know what that tells me? That tells me you're thinking in the natural like the disciples were. It was never about signs, it was never about having to prove it. Because in the natural, those things, they, they, sound, they sound terrifying to me, actually. And it, it kind of sounds like today, where we're at. But remember, if we read it in context, and what the Spirit of God breathed on us to understand, listen to this. Listen to this. It's the next verse. It's verse 27. It says, Then, in the midst of that turmoil... Everyone will see the Son of Man coming on a cloud with power and great glory. So when all these things begin to happen, stand and look up for your salvation is near. That day is near. It can happen, I, I believe. I don't I really don't I don't think I have to say I believe. I based on the word of God, it can happen at any moment. Any moment. without any sign to warn us. The victory that has already happened on the cross, the kingdom is already here. But I can't see it, Pastor. Well, there's the problem, isn't it? Or maybe you're just unsure of that statement today. I don't know. Because do you feel like a kingdom? You, you want me to be honest? When I'm praying at, at, at the hospital for Tracy, I don't always feel all super amped up in faith either. It's a battle. It's a spiritual battle to trust God in the face of horrible things. Because in the natural, life stinks. 
always feel victorious. I think more pastors need to say that. Not saying, you know, I'm not talking about confessing. You know what I mean, right? I gotta be careful everything I say. In the natural, what I feel and what I see, do you know what it feels like? It feels like defeat. Naturally, that's what life feels like. But things are not as they appear for you, believer, this morning. And do you know why that is? Because Jesus still walks through locked doors. That you may be hiding behind today. Because it feels safe in there, right? And you're afraid of what could be coming next. But you know what he comes in? He comes in and he says, hey, 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 peace, peace be with you. Peace be with me. Let me show you something, right? You're, you're going through stuff. He says, I got you. I know what you're going through. Because look at my hands. Look at, look. He's not showing them to just prove to them. He's showing them to say, I've, I've been through all this. I know what suffering is like. I know what it's like to feel like you're going to, I know whatever you're going through, I know it. I've been there. And look at me now. This same life is promised to you in Christ. And that's not enough. He says it again to them, right? He says again, why? Why? He says again, and then later on a third time, but he says, hey, hey, you saw this, but wait, peace. Because I see something is happening in the natural again. You're not getting it fully. You're not fully there. Let me help, Jesus says, as he still does today. Here's my spirit. Let me breathe on you. The same life that was breathed into dust of creation. I think that has some power. Look beyond the natural past, the face of your enemies this morning, church. Whatever you've been hiding behind, it could be the sum of all your fears, which for a lot of us is death, right? We have the fear of death. Unless somebody in here you want to die, but for the most part, we don't want to suffer, we don't want pain, we don't like death. But, Pastor, how do I know that Jesus is saying, how do I know that, how do you know that Jesus is saying this to you this morning? That I didn't just like scratch some notes down and say, yeah, this will be cool. Let me just tell them that Jesus is saying this to them. Because not every, nobody really is hearing Jesus, right? I wanted that so bad in all, all my overdoses in the hospital. Do you know what I wanted? I wanted to see a white light. Oh, you guys know what I'm talking about. Anybody in recovery? I, I did it just to see if there was heaven. I wanted to see a sign. I never got it. I'm not saying some people can't. I said the Holy Spirit could do whatever he wants, but God knew what was right for me. He said, if I'm going to build this guy's faith, who's been a drug addict most of his life, and his, his life is built in the natural experiences, I'm not going to give him an experience that could become an idol. I'm going to give him me and my spirit, and it's invisible. And that's what he wants to do. So if you're not hearing his voice, you're like, well, yeah, you're talking, but I don't see anything. I don't hear him. Let me give you a hint of how this is possible this morning. And this is going to come in, and I'm closing. Let's come into why you're here, everybody. This is why you are all here, whether you acknowledge it or not. Why the church exists today. It's Ephesians 1.17. It says, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your heart enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, the Christians. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he was raised 
from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named not only in this age but also in the age to come and he puts all things can you guys say all things just wow I just wanted to hear it so I made sure it's what it said all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church which is his body the fullness of him who fills all do, do, you, do you hear it? do you hear him now do you hear it now you are his witnesses we are his witnesses his voice to the nations bearing testimony of him so if you're hearing the spirit of Jesus and someone else, you're hearing him. We are his spokesmen, his ambassadors. Well, that sounds like uh, only God can speak. What? He, he left us here to proclaim this with such a purpose and a mission. He left his spirit for a reason. And here it is. Yeah. Here's, here's, why, here's why you're here. Just stand up. Come on. Come on, let's stand up. Not only to stand up, besides because somebody suggests to you, but I know you've been sitting a while. He has commissioned us to do what he did and say what he said. And that would mean that he's commissioning you by the power of his spirit to walk through locked doors into places where people are bound in fear in their minds you know that i'm not talking about this if they walk through doors to spiritually confront people with the gospel to see lives change from hiding behind afraid of all their ideas about god and religion and what they've been told to be set free by the power of the spirit that's why that's why we're here it's a mission. But without the Spirit, do you know what it, you know what it is? I mean, it's a commission, right? But without the Spirit, it sound, it, it's an omission. I mean, it's, 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 it's lacking something oh, rather than a commission. That's why you need the Spirit. But the disciples learn later on. Well, later on, they're like, we never had to see it to begin with. You know why? Because all we had to do is trust in what he already said. We had to trust in his word. All the things he taught us, all the things we're writing down as Matthew the tax collector and all the other guys are writing it down knowing that this would be read to us one day. And if you think you can't understand it, with the spirit of God you can. And walk in it. And that's because he's a man of his word. And he's made promises. And he does not go back on his promises. You have to trust him this morning. This morning, like in seven minutes or so, and if, you know, 11.30 comes and you gotta go check out your kids, that's how close we are this morning. There are some in here, you've been praying for this, what we call in, I don't know, probably more charismatic circles. I want a fresh touch from God, right? It's okay. We can say that, right? I want a fresh touch from God. Yeah, I do. The Spirit of God, despite what you feel, despite what your natural man really craves, which is proof all the time, the Spirit of God is in this place today. He is present. He is present in the midst of his body once again, like he was last Sunday, like he is actually when you get in your car, if you want to get technical. And, and, and for a lot of you who are going to receive, he's going to breathe life into you this morning. Even, even wisdom and understanding of his word like you've never had before. So this morning, we're going we're gonna to worship like... They're going to do whatever they're going to do. 
in the Bible, there is clear, clear evidence of this. And I'm sorry I don't have the verse numbers, but some of you do. You know what I'm talking about. It was Paul. Something about the laying on of hands. Something about God using us, I don't know, as channels, right? Without getting crazy. But it's true. This morning, God wants to touch you. Do you believe that this morning? I mean, are we just here for for church as usual? If you'll say, you know what, Pastor, I still, I don't feel uh, victorious. I don't, I want a fresh touch from God. Just begin to come up. Would you just begin to come up this morning? You want the breath of God in your life. You want the Holy Spirit in your life. I believe that God's so powerful that even in in a, a limited time American service, he will move through people who are willing to receive and people who are willing to give. He says, if you seek me, you will find me. And the the thing is, when he said that, he wasn't talking about seeing him in the physical. He's saying you're going to find him in the spirit. And you're going to be made alive in the the spirit. That the, The part of you that you've been starving all week. And he doesn't hold it against you. He forgives you. He's not like, oh, you aren't spiritual enough. You can't receive anything this morning. I received the Holy Spirit in power on my worst weeks as an early Christian. Full of sin in my mind. What qualified me? The blood of Jesus. Holy Spirit is here to touch you this morning. As, as, we, uh, as you pray, as they worship, it's going to be uh, me, my wife and I. Okay? My wife and I are just going to come and and just touch you. Nothing weird. We're not pushing anybody over, okay? Just get that out of your minds. Take all fear of what's happened to you in the past out. It's a gentle touch from God this morning. And we're simply going to pray that the breath of God give you new life today. That the Holy Spirit fill you. And in that feeling for some of you, the the remainder of your addictions and mental stuff that you're struggling with, they're going to be gone as soon as you're touched. It just happens that way. I can't explain it. Would you seek after God this morning as His Spirit touches your life? Come on.